with uh, all sincerity. They are a massive organisation. Um, and uh, we have um, the presentation, Big Bigger Tax Equals Big Data. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to go through... Is that me feedback? Is it somebody else? No. I haven't got a pacemaker either. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, yep. yep good, okay. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, big attacks, big data. So when I saw the title of the, uh, the conference, Big Data, I thought, I'm sure we can dig up some, uh, some information that's gonna be, gonna be useful. Um, and it was quite interesting listening to Stephen and Kate talk uh, in the earlier sessions. Um, and one of the things that, that Kate was talking about actually reminded me of a uh, a time when a few years ago I used to do Safe and Secure Online, which was a, um, a cyber security teaching program for um, kids, year seven. And what we used to do, it was sponsored by a company called ISC Squared, who does a certificate of security uh, training. And we used to go around into schools teaching at year seven and spend an hour, a couple of hours with them and talk to them about cyberbullying, talk to them about generic you know, internet hygiene, and that sort of thing. And as, you know, as, as Kate mentioned, it's very difficult at times to try and grab the attention of your average year seven student. So bear in mind this was a few years ago, uh, to give it a bit of context, you'll realize why. Uh, what I did, I said, okay, let's start off by figuring out how much you are portraying online. You know, how much do you trust about what's happening online? So I used to get them all to say, right, okay, everybody who uses Facebook, stand up. Yes, it was a few years ago. That's when kids actually thought Facebook was still cool. Um, and they all stand up. I said, fantastic. Right, everybody who's 13, please sit down. And they'd all look at me and say, oh, don't be stupid, sir. We're, we're year seven. None of us are 13. And I said, fantastic. Right, so you're now all have admitted, especially to your teachers, that you've all lied to get online, because you're all 12 years old, and so you all lied about your age to get online. So that's your first bit of bad stuff that you've had to do on the internet. Some were quite creative. One guy was a 48-year-old farmer from Wisconsin. So I thought for innovation, that wasn't too bad. But the idea was that they'd been trying to, you know, they'd already created these fake personas. So when you're talking about cyberbullying, when you're talking about passwords, when you're talking about everything else, it made it, it helped to resonate to the story. And then we started talking about passwords. And passwords was always quite interesting because, um, again, this was a few, a few years ago, so 2012, so people were, you know, kids in those days were virtually working on the principle of their passwords were either, bearing in mind, it's also North London, so it's either going to be Arsenal or One Direction or Harry Styles were going to be the passwords, and that was about it. And we would sort of give them advice about what to use for passwords. And that's changed a lot recently. I mean, when we were, you know, seven years ago, the advice about passwords was what you need to do is you need to change it every 30 days or every 60 days. Have an exclamation mark in there. Put a, a pound sign in there. Put a euro sign in there because, you know, the Americans wouldn't know what a euro sign is if they're trying to hack you and all that sort of stuff. All that happened was it made passwords really complicated to use, especially the password reuse and all that sort of stuff. So what was happening was that people just, ended up using their old password because, you know, if somebody said, um, change your password every 30 days, what would you do? You stick a one on the end of your existing password. That's all it was. You didn't, you didn't create any new password. You just used the same ones before. And as I'm now sort of, as I'm the sort of the technical expert in my, in my peer group and um, I'm beginning to be, and the sort of technical support to uh, an elderly uh, group of, uh, of relatives, and, and technically illiterate friends, they sort of come to me and sort of say, oh, can you just sort out my little pro problem on the laptop? Or I can't get it to talk to the printer. I can't get it on the internet. I can't do this. I can't do the router. And I go around and I sort of say, so um, have you changed your password since the last time I was here? Uh, you, you, no, no. Okay, so it's still, still the same one, you know, fluffy one or something, whatever it's going to be. Um, and I said, look, I, you know, I keep saying, have you tried using a password manager? I said, oh, no, I won't use a password manager. 
can't put all your eggs in one basket. That, that's a bit dangerous. Uh, yeah. um, and so I, I decided to actually sort of get my dad one of these. This is a book. You write your passwords in it. Now, years ago, we were told, don't write your passwords down, because people used to write them down, stick it on a post-it note on the screen. So I decided, I tell them, find a book. Write your passwords down, because if somebody breaks in, they're not going to be looking for a book on your bookshelf. They're going to be looking for something shiny and worth a lot of money. They're not going to be looking for books. And you're going to have a password that's going to be unique, that's going to be secure, and somebody from China or wherever is not going to be able to find it. So what I want to talk about, and lots of stuff today, is um, what we generate in data. So Akamai as a company, um, has anybody heard, who's heard of Akamai here? That's a lot more than I was expecting, which is really good. So Akamai is an overlay on top of the, uh, on the internet, which essentially allows you to access all of your popular websites, watch your popular TV, all of that sort of stuff in really good fashion. So it makes a lot of the internet quicker, faster, more safe, and more secure. Um, and we do some reports every couple of months through what we call our state of the internet, uh, or we call it the SOTI, because we love an acronym. And to give you an idea of what we talk about in big data, these are some of the figures that we have. So um, we can deliver, at the moment, our traffic capacity is about 80 terabits per second. Um, we have 2,400 global points of presence, which basically works out at about a quarter of a million nodes around the planet. When you add that up, that means we see every day about 1.3 billion client devices. Um, we see 2 trillion DNS requests, and that's important when you think about what we're going to be talking about later, but also in relevance to what Stephen was talking about earlier on and 178 billion application attacks. And that's every day. So think about that in terms of having a data lake that you can go in, start manipulating, start looking at, start analyzing for trends, and start analyzing for uh, new attack vectors and zero days and things like that. So um, this is an example of what we call credential abuse. So um, has anybody heard of a website called haveibeenpwned.com? If you haven't, go to it, put your email address in, and be scared, because you will be on it. Um, and one of the reasons that it's scary is the fact that just about, and anybody who's ever used LinkedIn is, is probably on it as well, um, is the password reuse. The fact that people are inherently lazy because we've had all of these problems with giving different information about usernames and passwords, people are lazy. Everybody has a username and a password which is normally an email address and a password that's been on a website that's been compromised. People take that information and they go and try and put it onto another website. Because once they get an email address plus a password plus a website that works, that's a valuable commodity and they can resell that on to somebody else and make money out of that. And we looked at about, uh, about an eight month period last year and we saw about 28 billion credential stuffing attacks. Um, now there was four spikes uh, there's a big one in June where we saw about a, um, you know, uh, 250 million attacks going to go in July, and then two big spikes in October. Um, and we've actually tried to correlate that to the breaches that happened in the previous month to see if there was a big data breach and that related to a big credential stuffing attack. And we saw about, I think it was about 18 million um, accounts were breached in, in June, uh, sorry, in May, in in June, we saw 140 million. Again, not much in October, but we did see 925 million accounts breached just before in, uh, in September. Now, could you draw a correlation to the fact that you then had those two big spikes? Possibly. But in, in all likelihood, what it was down to was, um, was something else. So... That, that, that was try, I was trying to sort of think of an analogy for this. Um, does anybody remember a song called A Town Called Malice? Yeah? 1982. And um, it went straight in at number one in the charts. Now, in those days, nothing went straight in at number one in the charts unless it was banned by the BBC. That was a surefire way to get number one. But a Town Called Malice went straight to number one. And in those days, the only way you could get 
to number one is basically be on top of the pops or be on radio one. And anything else, we never didn't get there. Town Call Malice went straight into the first time people were hearing it was on the chart show. Um, so how come it, what, it got to number one? How come it was so popular? And it was hype. It was one of those things where people were just, there's enough people who started talking about it. So people went out to buy it to find out what all the hype was about. So it was one of those sort of self-perpetuating stories that got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is what happened in a, in, in a similar uh, attack here where there was this a retailer who was working on um, a hype model to try and promote the brand, promote awareness, do a lot of advertising, and they do a lot of branded stuff, that sort of stuff, and um, do very short-lived sales at, at quite high, high value. And what you end up with is a case of inventory theft. And you've probably all come across inventory theft at some point in, in your online uh, shopping career or whatever. Um, when you try and get onto a website and you're trying to purchase something and you get click, 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 no, try again, try again, try again, try again. It's because the reason you can't get onto it and then two minutes after the release of the tickets or the, the product or whatever, they've all sold out. The reason you can't get on is because there's a whole bunch of automated machines that are going in there trying to grab all that content. And this is what happened in this one where we saw uh, the normal account was 130 million uh, human requests. In the same nine-day period of this, we saw half a billion requests from bots. That was spread over 1.8 million IP addresses, 31,000 ASNs, and 95,000 user agents. So when you, when you actually look at the, the big spike, that was coming in at 11,000 transactions per second. So this wasn't a, somebody trying to steal content. Now, this is somebody trying to basically batter down any defenses that are being put in place, any bot management, any application firewalls, anything like that, to try and beat through what was there. And they used three different botnets to be able to do this, and there's a few details on that later on there. But a lot of organizations think, well, yeah, fighting bots is a, is a relatively simple thing to do, isn't it? We just, uh, we can just put up a capture. Because everybody likes captures, aren't they? Yeah. And 60%, this is the reason why people don't pull all bot management solutions up there. 60% of people realize that nobody likes doing capture. If we're going to put in a bot management solution, if you're going to be able to add, understand those human requests and be able to separate them from the automated requests, you've got to have something in line that's going to be seamless. You've got to have something in line that doesn't impact the user journey whatsoever. Because no uh, e-commerce website wants to put capture in there that's going to turn off any users from doing business on their website. And when you start trying to quantify it, this is quite an, an interesting survey that was done by Ponemon a couple of years ago. Um, so if we look at this sort of, you know, this is the amount of money lost to fraud per compromised account. And if you look at the, the first one, looking at, uh, there's five grades there, most common one is 100 to 500 dollars. That's the value lost for per compromised account. Now let's think about how many accounts are actually compromised per t attack. Similar sort of numbers. Most common one there is 101 to 500. So if you just add up the two figures from the two ones, they do 500 dollars from the first one and 500 times the second one, put out a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, and this doesn't happen once. This happens seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven times a year. So you've now got a seven-figure problem. And then when you tie in with that with the additional stuff, which is the other annualized costs, things like downtime, customer churn, because when somebody sees that the uh, account there's been fraud relating to an organization, or there's been credential theft, or there's been something else relating, there's a lot of brand image that's, that's affected. So a lot, of a lot of users may churn, go to a different bank, go to a different provider or whatever. What we then try to do is break that information down of all of those 28 billion credential abuse attacks that we saw. We then try to break them down into which particular sector they were actually fitting in. Now you can see here there's uh, retail is the most, most common with uh, 10 billion attacks. But video media and uh, media and entertainment, which is this one and this one, 
when you add that one together, that's about 11 billion attacks. And when you understand the, the reason behind that, it, it, it's quite clear. There's um, so a lot of videos, though, like there was an example in Australia a couple of months ago of a guy who got convicted because uh, he'd made uh, money by selling accounts that he basically done credential stuff on. So he did Netflix, uh, Hulu, and Spotify. He went to dumps of usernames and passwords, which are freely available on the internet, and he just pumped them into those three companies and said, right, okay, I've got a match. Here's one, here's a match. And then he basically put that on his website. And he'd keep on doing that with thousands, millions and millions of, of email addresses. And he made about 300,000 Australian dollars just by doing that. All he had to do was get a username and a password, match it up with Netflix or Hulu or Spotify or whatever, and then he had a holy trinity of those three things, then he could actually resell that market. He made $300,000 on that. He was eventually found and convicted. But when people think $300,000 and all I've got to do is a bit of this, that's nice and easy. I don't have to worry about it too much. And, yeah, and YouTube is your friend. So there's a gazillion ways that will show you how to do it. When you actually break it down, so what we've done here is we've sort of broken down all of the attack, uh, all of the, the, organ, the verticals into individual uh, organizations, but we obviously haven't given them, I don't know why the names. Um, so you've got things like office supplies, commerce portals, jewelry, and then apparel. Uh, the, one of the interesting factors, especially around when you go look at the inventory theft, is that there's a, a, a very interesting figure about the amount, the, the actual value of the market. So there's the value of the actual sale market, but there's a value for the resale market. That's somebody who's gone into a website, purchased something before you can, and then trying to resell it to you on an auction site or something like that. That resale market is worth $1 billion. So there's a huge incentive for people to go out and rent botnets or build their own bots to be able to go in and try and do this inventory grabbing. So of those 28 billion attacks that we saw in that eight-month period, we did a we looked at some of the uh, source countries. Uh, no great surprises there. I mean, surprising that maybe China's not in there, but I think this is the fact that the U.S. is number one is not much of a surprise. They tend to host most of the bots, but they also tend to be the country that is attacked the most as well. Um, and then what we did for um, FS ISAC, which is a financial services um, information security body, we went in and gave them some ideas. Uh, a recent conference about what would be good to protect your particular website um, from things like credential stuffing. And um, there was a recent thing by uh, Google, which if anybody ever listens to the uh, Smashing Security podcast, I think the last one that was done on that, talked about um, uh, two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is phenomenally successful. Um, and be able to, to block things like credential stuffing. It's about 90, it seems 90 to 100% successful, um, especially if you've, got hard, if you've got hardware tokens, it virtually eliminates it. Um, SMS only does it to about three quarters of the way, it's about 75% successful. But things like adding a third informational proof element, as long as you allow your website to do, to allow pasting of usernames and passwords, because then you can utilize it with a password manager, putting a third informational proof is a really good tool because all credential stuff you attacks normally are populated with your email address and your password. If you then ask for your surname, that's not normally in all of those breaches. So it's a data element that the attackers haven't got. So it's just a way of putting something in there that the password managers can manage, but the attackers won't have. So one of the things we did, uh, another thing we uh, looked at was uh, API traffic. And um, in 2014, we were just concerned about, you, know, you saw how much traffic runs on our platform, how many nodes we've got. You know, those 2 trillion DNS requests, for example, and 178 billion application attacks. But we see so many websites that are traversing our, our network. And in 2014, we wanted to look at a percentage of how much traffic was actually going across the network. And looked at how much was API and how much was web. And we looked out at about 47% was API traffic. So about half the traffic was API, half the traffic was web. Um, 
And that was the breakdown on the left-hand side between whether it's JSON or XML, whatever. 2018, 83% of traffic is API. So four out of every five requests that are sent are non-HTML, which basically means that if you're thinking about all of the technologies you're putting in place to protect your websites, that's great. But that's one-fifth of the problem. Fourth-fifth of the problem is on the API. What are you looking at to put in place to protect the API? All of those queries that are coming in there. And when you actually look at the, what that's coming from, so if you look at the, you know, the API, it majorly media is one of the most common examples we still see here. But the driver behind all of that API is your mobile phone. How many people actually have opened, taken their mobile phone out today and used the browser? Who's used Safari or Chrome on their phone? Very rarely. The first thing you do is you open it up and you hit an app. That was a key point about mobile phones. That's what made them so, much, so useful, is you'd hit an app. You, know, you had to look to what the weather was, or what the train time was, or when I came up here this morning on the plane, I went onto my BA app for the onboarding pass. I didn't go on to the website. I used my app. And that's what's driving all of this traffic. And when you start looking at the, um, the breakdown of that, you can see that 66% is non-browser, so yeah, that's what it means. It's coming from your mobile phone. Um, it's coming from your TV. It's coming from your fridge. It's coming from your personal spy in your house or your digital assistant, whatever you want to call it. But all of these devices are generating that API traffic, so we need to be able to aware of how we're going to protect, how we're going to understand what that traffic is, because that's where the attack vectors are going to start coming in from. So. Again, back on the theory of big data, we love a big number. So um, this was an attack that we saw, um, and this was, a, so we're going to have like 1 billion, 1.2 billion, 1.4 billion, um, to give you an idea of the number of requests that we were seeing. And actually, in that first spike, this attack, we saw 4 billion requests come in over a relatively short time span. Um, now, we have a, a two sort of teams within Akamai that look at these big attacks. We have a SOC team, these are the guys who make sure the attack's being mitigated, the customer's staying up and everything else. And then we have a CERT team that go, ooh, that looks interesting. Let's have a play, let's see what we can find out. Let's see what was happening here. Um, because that was such a large attack. And what was interesting with this one, it was that when they started looking at it, first of all, that they, they looked at the, where the IPs were coming from, wasn't incredibly strange, but whatever. They looked at the user agents, they looked at... Um, various bits and pieces. They eventually managed to figure out that it's probably coming from a Microsoft um, framework that was generating it. And most of the IPs were coming from a NAT. And when they did the spread, they could see that the majority of it was coming from the US. Um, but they kept looking at it and thought, well, okay, well, let's maybe look a bit more detail. Let's look at the user agents. And they went through, and the user agent never changed. It never, ever changed. Now, this attack, vector, attack had been going for a long time, and we've been mitigating it. So the customer's up and running. There's been no impact whatsoever to the customer. And this was really odd. Because if you're launching a massive attack and you just keep bang, 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 and the, and the customer's not going down, normally what would happen is they try a little bit differently. You know, maybe they change an element, change the order of the headers, or put a different user agent in. But they didn't. They kept on using the same user agent, the same user agent, the same user agent. And eventually we started looking back at the traffic. What happened the previous week? The previous week, that we were seeing about 300 requests per second. Now we're sort of seeing you know, hundreds and thousands. Um, and we actually figured out what it was. was it was a warranty tool on a, 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 on a bit of software that had gone haywire. And it was continually calling up the customer and trying to post data onto it every single second. And all of these thousands and thousands of nodes they have were all trying to post back onto it. So it wasn't an actual attack in itself. It was just a warranty tool created by the vendor that was creating all of this additional traffic that was actually taking itself down. What we want to then try and do is, whether, these are, whether it's, it's a bot that's generating traffic to, for, from a warranty purpose, so it's actually designed to do a certain job, or you're looking at a Google, job, a Google bot which is designed to do a search engine, or it's a web scraper, or it's something that's trying to hack into your system. Um, 
we, it's, it's very difficult to categorize bots, and that's the difficult thing behind it. A web application attack is very simple. It's either a SQL injection attack or it's not. It's clear, you know, this guy's actually trying to nick something off you or it's <coughs> not. With a bot, it's very difficult to say that it's this or it's this. It's not a binary decision because you definitely want the Google bots, but you definitely want to block the bots that are trying to steal information, that are trying to scrape content from your website. So what you need to be able to do is think, well, how am I going to deal with this, this traffic? How am I going to block it? Because if I block all the traffic, they may try a different vector. If I give them the data they want, then I'm, 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 it's, just, it's not going to help me in the long run. So do I block the traffic? Do I serve up different content to them? Do I redirect them somewhere else? Do I tarpet them? Do I slow them down? And understanding all of these different types of bots is integral into the way that you need to manage that website. And this is the why the bots are able to be so clever, because they have multiple different ideas on how they can do it. So starting off with a very, very simple down at the bottom where you've got the IP blocking, um, and uh, we can just have like a single IP, a couple of IPs. It's very easy then as an IT security person to go in there, oh, we'll block that IP. Put blacklisting in there for that, blacklisting for there. But what happens if they ramp it up? You saw how many IP addresses we had on the previous one, and they were talking about 10,000 IPs or 20,000 IPs. Then it gets a little bit tricky. Yeah, you're going to have IT guys burning the fingers away, trying to do all those. And then they're going to come in with things like randomized user agents, uh, session replay, JavaScript support to get around common JavaScript challenges, going up to actually recording a human behavior. So they'll actually do a session where they record a normal user actually on a website and then replay that back so it, it's able to get past things like, are you using the mouse? Or, you know, we only you know, clicked on that, on that thing on, on the, the website that says, you know, I, uh, I, am, I am not a robot. Yeah, so when they click on the tick box, it, that's checking to see if you're using the mouse. So when you use the, the uh, recorded human behavior, it can record that tracking of the mouse over there and then replay that back. So you need to be able to have things that can detect that human behavior as well, or recorded human behavior. Um, so the last bit is, go back, actually, then I, I definitely want to have another conversation with Stephen, who was talking about uh, who was earlier from this morning, because this goes on to something that is a real drive around phishing. Um, and phishing, I think, is, is, is really interesting in terms of the, the, the amount of, al the amount of uh, data that we have to work with. Remember right at the beginning, we looked at that slide and we showed the amount of DNS requests we see on a daily basis of two trillion. That data gives us real insight onto the type of, it, of uh, malicious websites that are out there that are trying to gather data, that are trying to fish you to try and get you to go onto a website so that you will download a payload, that you'll download a keylogger, you'll download something they can use to steal information off you. So one of the, 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 the um, slides that Stephen showed you had a uh, you know, click here to continue with the links on it. Most people here, I guess, would look, when they saw a dodgy looking email or something that's slightly suspicious and it has a link in it, you hover over the link just to sort of see what is the URL it's going to point to. So when you get that email from Barclays or from Ocado or whoever it may be, you look to see, okay, is that link going to anything remotely, remotely similar to Ocado or whatever? And chances are, it's going to be saying it's going to go to some random domain that looks completely weird. It makes no sense. It doesn't look like any language whatsoever. It's going to be a random bunch of letters, and they're generated by what's called DGA, which is a, what we call here a domain generation algorithms. And the, the attackers are generating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these domains on a daily basis. And this is linked between the the payload and the actual server. So they're generating these up, and these random domains are being used to basically create a myriad of different... So you can't go in and just put that into your firewall saying, actually, no, don't go to that one. That's a bad URL or that's a bad domain. Don't use that one. Because they're creating them every day, these domains may last two or three days, and that's it. I'll get rid of them. But what they're doing is you need to figure out then, well, how are we going to do that? Because they're using this combination of a date plus a C plus a lexicon, and then pumping that up and creating these, we need to be able to track how those domains are generated and being able to start linking them together. And we can do that through things like 
Um, lexico I can never say this properly. Lexicographical order algorithms or domain similarity algorithms. So this is about power off in a second. That's why I need to press it. Um, and using those two mechanisms, what we're doing is we're looking at the characters within the actual domain and looking at that frequency and looking at the probability that those letters will appear in real life. And do you remember, we're seeing 2 trillion DNS requests a day, so we've got a good data pool to pull from to generate that probability. And then we're looking at the domain similarity algorithms. So when we can see all of these hundreds of domains being generated um, frequently, we can go and use things, other OS in, such as Shodan, such as going to the name registrars, finding out when they're being generated, how they're being generated, that, tying that in with the IP numbers that are related to those domains. And that gets interesting when you start talking about fast flux. Now, fast flux is a, is, is a really interesting mechanism by which organizations use technology to be able to hide behind the command and control servers and hide their proxies that they're using to be able to get this malicious content. So when you click on that link, where does the URL go to? What IP address is it going to? What is the name server that's giving you that IP address? And fast flux is a method of, um, hi of hiding it by having lots of different nodes, uh, all the proxies, all of these thousands of different IP addresses that are sitting in front of them at command or control servers. They're registering and deregistering their IP addresses from the domain. Now, this isn't a couple of hundred. This could be uh, 14,000. This is an example we had. Um, and the, the purple, Dots are IP addresses, the green dots are name servers, and the red dots are um, domain names. And this gives you an idea of, what, of, of a typical phishing attack uh, or typical um, network that's geared around launching phishing attacks, launching application attacks, and how they are putting in place processes to protect themselves. So what's happening is that all of those IP addresses will register and deregister with, the, with, with the, their A records onto the domain. So when you click on the domain, it may or may not go to one of those 14,000 IP addresses. When you click on they also do run the name servers as well. So they're moving the name servers around in the same process. So this is happening on a daily basis. So you can't use a firewall to block the IP address. And when we started looking at the, the mechanism behind it, so there's two methods of fast flux. One is single flux, which is just the A record, and then there's the, uh, the dual flux, which is the, um, the NS record as well. Um, there is a white paper on this which goes into a lot of detail, which is really, really interesting on this. But this d diagram here just gives you an example of all of the different domains we were tracking on this 14,000 different IPs and how the IP addresses were registering and deregistering. You can see the spikes and troughs within that. When we actually looked at the country, so we had the hosting service, the, the, the nodes that were hosting the malicious traffic, and then we had the command and controls. When we actually looked at them, we had two things. So 10 countries on the, the, on the left, which is the top IP addresses per country, Ukraine, Romania, Russia, a lot of common IPs. So they're hosting malicious content in places where generally it's going to be quite hard to, to go out and, and kick them off. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, these are the com command and control servers. Now, ignore the first column, which is reserved, because that's all RFC 1918 addresses, so that's, you know, uh, 192, 168 stuff. Um, U.S., when we looked at about 50% of the IP addresses on the U.S., top 10 IP addresses, um, they all related to Forbes 100 companies. You know, they were uh, IP addresses from major organizations, banks, insurance companies, uh, e-commerce sites, that sort of stuff. And what they were doing is they were basically trying to get the IP addresses so they could inherit the reputation of those good companies. So they're saying, okay, well, this all, the, the end, look at these, all these different, all these good IP addresses. They must be relatively, it must be inherit that, it must be good. Um, but they never used the IP addresses, but the IP addresses were there to, to trying to inherit that benefit. That's just turned itself off. Um, okay, so um, I think I'm just about, yes. So wrapping up, um, 
all of the information we've gone through today, so we've done quite a few blogs, we've gone through quite a few monthly uh, reports that we do, it's all in what we call the state of the internet. Uh, so all of that data we saw from all of the, uh, the petabytes of information that we capture on a daily basis, um, all goes into what we call state of the internet. Uh, do go on to the akamai.com website or go on to the, the blog site and uh, download some of the white papers. Most of the stuff we talked to today is all in the white papers. And if you have any questions, I'll be around later. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, fascinating. Um, the numbers that Akamai deal with are incredibly large, so, so um, this is not uh, to be sniffing at, not something you could handle on your own home network. Um, the next up, we have um, Ivan Salter from Royal London. Uh, information security, the psychological gap. 